So I'm going to talk to you guys about web components and uh, a little bit about ES6, the next version of JavaScript. And uh, to do that, I'm going to go a little bit backwards in time to start uh, and go through how we arrived at web components. Uh, then I'm going to talk about web components themselves. And uh, then I'm going to go through a little bit of the ES6 goodness that we're starting to see pop up in JavaScript talks. Just get a sense, uh, you guys building apps with JavaScript today? And how many people here are using like Babel or Tracer to transpile from ES6? OK, like three people, and I'm one of them. That's cool. Uh, ES6 is fun, so we'll check it out. Um, I'm going to go through the, the sort of the beginning of time here, and we'll look at some of the early JavaScript frameworks. And I'm going to put scare quotes around that, because I don't really think these things count as frameworks. They're more like libraries. And the, the big reason that these things kind of came about is because the browser used to be uh, really bad. The various browsers um, had a lot of inconsistencies, especially in the DOM. This was one of the predicates for HTML5, uh, where they standardized all the bugs in the DOM so that everyone had the same bugs. And I'm not kidding. That's exactly what happened. So around 2006, uh, this library called Prototype came out. It had no docs whatsoever, uh, and everybody kind of just got up to speed with it by reading the source code. And it mostly painted over those differences in DOM implementations across the browsers. Um, it also kind of made life a little bit easier uh, for working with remoting. And the term AJAX got coined. It used to be all caps AJAX, but that became uncool to do. Um, so I'm not doing it anymore. If we look at Prototype's API, you can see that it's, it's pretty, pretty simple stuff. Uh, we grab a, a div element out of the DOM, or we create a div element in the DOM. And then we extend it. Um, and this little act of extending the div element actually made Prototype really unpopular. You were, you were messing with built-in objects, and you could change the behavior or the expected behavior of a built-in. Uh, this is the venerable AJAX that kicked off uh, the browser uh, becoming an application thing. Um, you can see it's pretty verbose. And it's interesting that we've sort of moved away from this. But the asynchronous nature where we pass a success and a failure callback is is pretty commonly seen today. Um, prototype was really good at working with the DOM. It painted over the differences in adding and removing elements. It painted over the differences in eventing. Um, but it didn't do anything for effects. And Thomas Fuchs, who's one of my favorite JavaScript developers in the world, who writes amazing code, it's totally worth reading even today, uh, created an extremely hard to spell and find library called Scriptaculous. And it was back when it was like popular to do you know, .us. So it was like script uh, .cul, or I can't remember it. It doesn't matter because you don't need it today. Um, effectively, it would use timeouts and absolute positioning to move elements. And you'd have beautiful code like this, where we would inline on-click handlers uh, to move stuff around, which interestingly, React is bringing back. Um, then the big boy came along, jQuery, and this sort of changed the entire world. Um, jQuery's big win, I think, uh, truly, was that it, it gave uh, developers a really intuitive API to work with. It was very simple for anybody to pick it up and start running with it and building applications in the browser that um, appeared to be fairly um, responsive. Uh, it definitely dominated. I think it's still in over 90% of the top 100 websites, something like that, um, and it's around even today. There's sometimes that you'll see on the internet about once a year, people say you don't need jQuery anymore. And I think they're probably right. But jQuery does paint over a lot of browser differences, especially if you have to go back in time to browsers like IE8. So it's still a big deal. One of the more interesting things about jQuery is that very early on, it built in an extension model uh, where it would map the prototype of the jQuery object to a name function. And so instead of walking over the prototype, you were walking over this sort of built-in thing called function. This huge ecosystem of plugins erupted, and even today. And I think this, there's a lesson in there for developers about building uh, pluggable uh, libraries. And so you've probably all seen code like this. You know, this is classic jQuery, except for usually it turns into this huge pyramid of code over time. Um, and jQuery kind of took a lot of the ideas that we saw in libraries like Prototype uh, for doing things like Ajax, but it made things a little nicer, a little cleaner syntax. Um, jQuery also baked in animation, so you didn't need to load a separate library to do that, and that was you know, probably something people wanted. Um, and then around the same time, another library came around called MooTools. Anybody here build anything with MooTools? A few people? Cool. Yeah, MooTools was pretty sweet, actually. I, I liked it a lot. 
Um, very similar API to the other guys. Uh, very similar kind of semantics uh, where you're passing callbacks into like these constructor objects. Uh, MooTools was the first one to kind of introduce a class system and a class-based hierarchy. Uh, the code for this was, I felt, really beautiful and created kind of nice components. Um, but the internet voted and it decided that it liked jQuery better. I'm gonna mention YUI because YUI actually was really popular for a flash in the pan and people were building a lot of stuff with it. YUI a couple of years ago was completely deprecated and walked away uh, from the code. The code's still there, it's just not being maintained in any way. And I think this is an interesting thing to note for yourself from a risk profile when you're evaluating technologies. If there's a single vendor behind that technology, it might have some risk in the future when the corporation decides it doesn't wanna fund it anymore. Um, YUI was also pretty verbose and Java-like, and so they later changed things to look a bit more like jQuery. Uh, Douglas Crockford was a big part of how this library kind of became what it was, uh, so it was very idiomatic JavaScript. There's another library, and it's still kicking today, and it's called Dojo, and it does all this stuff too. In fact, Dojo likes to brag how it already did it before everybody else, um, and it really, it really quite literally did. Dojo has a big community behind it, has a lot of people that work on it, uh, and there's a ton of enterprise applications that are built with it still to this day. So it still remains pretty important. A lot of the concepts that we're now seeing kind of roll into the broader mainstream are, were probably first prototyped in Dojo, including things like uh, asynchronous module design, like we see with this require function. Problem is, all these things kind of did the same thing, and it also had all the same problems. They, 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 they built on top of the fact that the browsers kind of sucked. Uh, now the browsers don't really suck, so maybe we don't need them. Um, animation with CSS and being declarative is kind of like a thing you want to do now. You don't want to use set timeouts. This mobile thing appears to be happening, and so we want to have the smallest footprint of code possible so that you get the best execution time. Um, all of these things had a concept of a module or a closure or a module pattern, but none of them did it the same way, and so they all had their own island ecosystems where they couldn't interoperate. Everybody was recreating the data grid like a million times, um, and this actually still persists to this very day. Um, I guess one of the other things that kind of became tough was uh, iterative apply and chaining, like we see in jQuery, can be really tough to test. Uh, the big problem, really, is that these things were really quite bloated, uh, depending on what you were doing, and had a lot of tightly coupled code. It would be at least two to 300 kilobytes before you could get Hello World on the screen, and that's, that's, a, lot of, that's a lot of code to do not much. Um, another issue is that most of these things poke at the DOM, and every time you interact with the DOM, you force a repaint, and this can be quite slow. Somewhere around after the iPhone was released, we realized that we would probably need to be building more performant applications. Um, now that people were accessing these apps with low-powered phones, and so micro-libraries kind of came around very briefly. Uh, I worked on one called XUI back in 2008. I like to think that maybe we seeded the term micro-library, but I doubt we did. We just said micro-tiny. Um, and XUI had like a very jQuery-like syntax, except for it targeted only mobile browsers, and I think we got it down to something ridiculous like four or five K. Um, it was really tiny. Lawn Chair was another project I work on. It had the concept of models. Um, it's actually still kind of trucking today. People do use it. Very simple idea where you would just get you know, data and you would set it using either local storage or uh, WebSQL or other things that can store stuff on the, uh, in the browser like window.name. Thomas Fuchs, that guy from Scriptaculous, saw XUI and he thought, that's pretty sweet. I'm gonna do the exact same thing, but I'm gonna clone the jQuery UI or API. And so he took the, the spirit of XUI, but he applied it directly to jQuery's API, creating kind of a workalike. Um, Zepto is really nice, and it's actually still really popular in a lot of mobile applications, and I totally recommend reading the source code um, if you're into doing that sort of thing. This code would look just the same as jQuery, but there'd be far less code for it. It's also worth noting today, jQuery is really well maintained, it's really battle tested, and they have slimmed it down substantially, so. Maybe you don't need it, maybe you do, who knows. Either way, this is just redoing the same thing over and over again, and we maybe as collective consciousness realize that if we keep doing the same thing over and over again, we're probably gonna keep having the same problems over and over again. And then the next generation of frameworks came along. And so I'm gonna quickly run through these guys. 
Backbone was easily the first of its kind, and I think it, it disrupted things. People realized that, hey, maybe we should separate our concerns and start treating our clients a lot more like we'd architect our servers. We'd separate our concerns around views and models and even routing. Backbone is really well-written code, um, and it's really tiny. And as a JavaScript engineer, uh, it's a joy to read. So even, I know I recommend doing this all the time, but you learn so much by reading other people's code. And I don't know if Jeremy Ashkanis was doing meth or what it was, but he wrote a lot of code in a sm small period of time. And Backbone was one of those things, also CoffeeScript. Yes, I did just sneak in a joke about him doing meth. Um, so Backbone grew quite large. Uh, I think today a lot of people are sort of moving over to this thing called ampersand. Oh, it should say JS, but whatever. And um, this is the, the thing I want you to like internalize or check out. So you'll notice here we got a view. And a view really is just a tag, ultimately. Um, and that tag, you know, we're going to give it some class names. And we're going to bind some events to it. Um, if I had an open method on this thing, when I clicked on the icon thing, it would fire that event. You get the idea. This is really similar to how web components look today um, from 100 feet. Google uh, came up with this thing called Angular. Is anyone building Angular apps here? Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. Quite a few of you are. Anybody here heard of Ionic? Yeah, Ionic's totally sweet. Uh, I might be biased. So Angular took a lot of the nomenclature of server-side enterprise development and then reassigned it into the client in different ways. Um, it's sort of weird. It has these, these things that it calls like controllers or models or whatever, and it does not quite what you think it will. Um, you can't build an Angular app um, without buying into this whole set of nomenclature and ways of working. You're not going to just like take part of your app and make it Angular. If you're going to Angular, you're going all the way on Angular. Uh, one nice piece about Angular, or one of my favorite pieces, is Karma Test Runner. Fantastic software, really good for doing development. Uh, it's like this live reload thing that can test in multiple browsers uh, simultaneously. Um, Ionic, I mentioned, it's rad. Uh, it's a mobile library for building uh, native apps using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript based on Cordova. Uh, they basically took Cordova and then they plopped a UI on top with, with Angular, and it's, it's quite good. The big deal about Angular for me, though, is Angular directives. And if you don't know Angular, a directive is a custom tag, of course, because that makes sense. Um, not really, but whatever. So this hello person tag um, is defined in this directive right here. In order to create a directive, though, I have to have a module. And in order to actually make it bind to some data, I have to have a controller. So that's that coupling I was talking about, where you get this sort of like nested dolls situation going on where you're separating your concerns maybe a little too much. Um, but regardless, custom tags. Interesting. Uh, Ember is another one. Is anybody here building Ember apps? OK, a few of you are. Cool. It's, it's making headway. Um, Ember is strongly inspired by Rails. Um, whether this is good or bad, I don't know. But if you're used to using Rails, um, then you're going to be very comfortable in the Ember ecosystem. Super well-written docs, uh, super great governance and onboarding for the community. I really, really respect how they handle that. Um, it's also kind of big, and it's kind of slow. It came from a thing called Sprout Core, and there's a lot of legacy code in it. It's really not appropriate for mobile. Uh, part of my job is to test these things on phones, and Ember is not quite there yet, but it's getting better all the time. It's got a new rendering engine called Glimmer, and they're doing a thing called Fast Boot, where um, you can pre-render your your app to a string and load it, load it faster. Interestingly, it also has components. And so you're starting to see a theme here. Uh, Ember components are actually script tags embedded in your application. I'm not really sure how that web maps back in their docs to web components, but this is what, a, what an Ember component would be. Very much like Angular, um, you end up, so this is my, my component, I guess. Or this is me invoking my component. This is my component definition, and this is me creating an app. Um, that loads it. And so that's kind of like Angular, where you get this little bit of coupling between the different layers. But pretty cool. Uh, works well. Anybody here building React applications? Oh, like two of us. Three. Right on. OK, so React um, has been getting a lot of attention because it, instead of copying server-side development paradigms and just like wholesale bringing them onto the client, the Facebook team decided to like actually address real problems that they were having. And the big real problem they were having is that the DOM was super slow. Um, 
it came up with a whole bunch of new concepts that the other frameworks are quickly copying now. Key one is the virtual DOM. Um, and so instead of touching the DOM and playing with it and modifying it all the time, it'll batch requests using request animation frame and it'll do diffing dynamically for you. So you only update what you need when you want to do it. Um, there's two promising early mobile libraries, Touchstone.js and React. And so if you're looking for like an equivalent to Ionic in the React world, those are worth checking out. I've seen apps built with it that you seriously no shit can't tell the difference between a native application. Um, really well done. One of the key things about React 2 is that it's, it's a functional programming style, and so it explicitly avoids mutating state, which makes it faster, but it also makes it a lot easier to reason about. Um, and again, custom elements. So one thing that people hate, 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 is that in React, you, you define JSX files, which allow you to inline uh, HTML, and not a lot of people like this. It's very similar to uh, an early proposal in JavaScript called E4X. You would be able to embed XML in your JavaScript. Not a very popular thing. Um, but you end up with these neat components, and this neat component lifecycle that you can just render into a page on any element that you want to. Uh, probably the simplest of them all, but it also doesn't include a lot of the plumbing. And so if you need to like, compose your application, have things like routes and models and the rest of it, that's up for you to solve. Uh, the Facebook team has a concept around this called Flux, and if you want to talk about it later, we can. I've got, I have opinions. Um, Polymers from Google, there's a great Eric Schmidt quote from a long time ago where they were like, wait a second, you got Chrome OS and you got Android, What's going on? Why do you guys have two operating systems? And Eric Schmidt said, well, a lot of companies would like to have one nice operating system. Very humble, Eric Schmidt. Anyways, I guess they feel the same way about JavaScript, so they've got two frameworks. Uh, Polymer is a forward-looking framework. Its idea is to battle test um, in, in kind of like progress specs around web components. Um, they're not really, they're saying now that you can use this and people do use it um, in, in anger for production applications. The current Google I.O. app is actually uh, a Polymer application. It's kind of big and it's kind of slow, legit. Once it loads, it's good. Polymer really took this custom tags thing all the way too. They, it's custom tags all the way down. So like everything you do is a custom tag. Um, Maybe this is good, maybe this is bad, I don't know. And so this is a custom element here called hello world element, um, and I'm defining it uh, literally almost entirely declaratively, which is kind of cool, kind of interesting. Um, so this is sort of the state of the art. These are the, the various JavaScript frameworks that are probably the most popular or getting the most attention. Um, and uh, there's still issues. So the module systems generally are incompatible. This is not totally the case. Uh, transpilers help us get through this, but it's, it's either common JS or AMD, uh, or good luck with that. And um, they all have kind of different concepts around what networking is going to look like, or how routing is done, or how it does data synchronization. But one thing that these guys all have in common is a custom elements implementation. So this is the part where I'm going to go through web components themselves. Douglas Crockford's really famous for having a book called JavaScript, The Good Parts, and everybody likes to joke and put it beside the, the JavaScript definitive guide. And JavaScript definitive guide's like this big, and web, you know, JavaScript, The Good Parts, is like that big, and you can read it in like 10 minutes. Um, web components, I think, is kind of similar. So web components is this blanket specific set of specifications for four different things. It's uh, about the template tag, HTML importing, the shadow DOM, which sounds way cooler than it is, Custom elements. So let's go through these. Um, you noticed in Ember, and this is really common in a lot of JavaScript applications, to, to fake out the, the browser and to put inert templates inside of a script tag, and we'll call it something else. Uh, the problem is script tags block execution, and so if you have a whole bunch of these things, your page can get quite janky, especially if you're like doing t any kind of scrolling and you're dynamically inserting these things. Um, famously, Facebook used to do this for its uh, like button, and so for every like button on the page as you scrolled, it would get this like stutter effect as the thing scrolled. Um, the template tag will fix this problem. It'll give you an inert spot to put strings. Um, kind of nice. You can put anything you want in there, and you can call it like a regular DOM element and do things with it. Um, I don't really care. I don't, I don't embed script tags. I would compile these things down to a single JavaScript source file. You shouldn't be embedding script tags, so it's like, 
you're, you're almost, in my view, encouraging worse behavior, but that's fine. So web components, template tag, it might help. Who cares? Um, HTML imports is an interesting idea. This is HTML that can load HTML, which maybe is a good idea, maybe it isn't a good idea. Um, it has a lot of problems. First of all, it's slow. You could imagine if you had a complex hierarchy of components, it could be calling all, making all kinds of network calls that are blocking each other. Resolution of those network calls, one might fail and then cause the rest of the application to not load. Um, HTTP2 should solve a lot of those concerns, but you know, it's not fully deployed yet. Uh, Mozilla's put out a statement that they don't want to add HTML imports. Google says they want to. Apple says they think it's a good idea, but they want to do it differently. And Microsoft's just staring at everyone, trying to not rock the boat too much or cool again. Um, so I don't know. Like, HTML imports might happen, it might not. It's, it's really unclear currently uh, from a specification standpoint. Um, the Shadow DOM, which sounds hella cool. Um, it, the idea is that it hides the implementation. And so like based, basic, any kind of built-in component right now, um, you don't have to like drill in and see what's going on. And a good example of this would be like the video player in your browser. You don't see like individual elements unless you want to. The Shadow DOM would give us this capability um, possibly in the browser. It's, it's in a weird state. Uh, it looked like no one was going to implement it, and then suddenly in the last couple of weeks, a lot of the browser implementers are, have come to the conclusion that maybe having totally global CSS is a bad thing after all, and that we might get some level of encapsulation for styling. Um, but I don't know when that's going to land or how it's going to land. There's a lot of complexity associated with it. So that's kind of a bummer. Um, <laughs> but then we get to custom elements, and this is a good part. Uh, this is the interesting part, and we've, I think we've got good validation at this point that this is probably an okay idea. Um, we know that all the major frameworks implement the concept in some fashion. Um, one of the problems with the custom element spec is that it's a single blocking call, and so if you have a whole bunch of these things, in theory, it could be a little bit slow. Um, it, ex it supports the idea of extending built-ins, and so you can extend already existing HTML elements and win all of their like accessibility features, should you so want those. Um, and then otherwise, it's just a regular DOM element. So this is pretty exciting. Here's the most simple syntax possible that I could cook up. Um, this is the blocking call that registers the element to the page, and so we're saying, all right, I'm gonna create a thing called a hello world element. Um, another thing to note, and I don't know if it's in spec or out of spec, but custom elements are defined in the DOM parser by having dashes in them, which is sort of freaky. I don't know why. Um, initially, they were talking about doing a leading X dash, but then people felt that smelled really bad, and so just dashes in them. Um, and then here I just append it into the DOM, and it creates this you know, tag called hello-world. If we want to take this idea a little further, and I think this is probably the most popular way in the more purist web uh, thinking, um, is to extend built-in elements. And the reason you'd want to extend a built-in element is that you'd get all of the, the accessibility features of the elements. And so if I wanted to create a button, instead of creating yet another span element that looks like a button, maybe I extend button. Um, and this is how you do that. The syntax is pretty obtuse. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on here. This could definitely be cleaned up a lot. I particularly don't enjoy the fact that I'm defining the tag name and then I'm saying I'm extending something and I'm extending it here. It's like, uh, I don't know how I feel about that. And then this part is very contentious right now uh, with folks at the W3C. In particular, Apple really doesn't like it. And I, I kind of don't blame them because you could imagine a, a world where we'd have something like, you know, Input type equals, you know, submit is submit thing. Uh, role equals button. It's like I have role, I have, you know, is, I have type. I mean, that's, that's not very easy to follow. Um, my argument against that type of thinking, though, is that if you think that the web has nice symmetry and beautiful APIs, you haven't been paying attention anyways, so fuck it. We should just do it. Um, so if we're going to have custom elements, then we're going to have to have a life cycle for these things. And this is where stuff starts to get um, pretty interesting, I think. And so very similar, in fact, to how we see uh, all of the, the user land frameworks approaching things, we've got 
these lifecycle callbacks. And so when I create a new element, I can set the inner HTML. Um, this is also contentious. Apple thinks it's, it's uh, redundant to add callback at the end of everything. And I, I kind of agree. It's sort of ugly. Um, once we attach something to the DOM, it'll fire this callback. If we remove something from the DOM and we want to do some cleanup, maybe we've got you know, hanging event handlers elsewhere in the, in the application, we can, we can hook into this detach callback. And then this allows us to create all kinds of problems in our code if we want to, um, where we can watch on attribute changes and we can programmatically intercept them and add different behaviors. Um, again, we have a blocking call down here for this super hello. Um, pretty verbose, pretty stinky um, code, but very powerful. Um, so we can do this now. You, you, this isn't you know, a, a fiction. This is stuff that we can do today. Um, both Mozilla and Google agreed that it would probably be better if there was only one polyfill as the specs uh, were advancing. And so there's a, a polyfill out there called webcomponents.js. Um, it has all of these things baked into it. Um, we really only care about document register element. And there's actually there's a dude that works at Twitter. Um, his Twitter handle is Web Reflections. He's got a fantastic library that just polyfills register element. Uh, if you're feeling like the entire Web Components JS polyfill is too big, it's only a couple hundred K, so it's not too bad. Um, and ideally, at some point, this thing is baked into some form of module system. So where, where we're at today, uh, right now it's basically only the Chromes uh, support this natively. Uh, Firefox is extremely likely, i.e., like I said, they're kind of eyeballing the whole thing. And uh, WebKit, Safari, Apple, effectively, wants to do this, but they just want to do it differently. Um, so let's talk about ES6 really fast. Is, yeah, I asked you guys. There's a few of us that are programming in ES6. I'll, I'll try and explain this stuff. So everybody always says, you know, what's the next big thing? You know, Node came along, and JavaScript was a big deal all of a sudden, and there's got to be another thing to satisfy my AD, uh, <laughs> HD. Um, I don't think it's going to be like Go or Rust, personally. I think it's actually going to be JavaScript. Um, there's enough new toys that it's an exciting language to learn and, and to use again. Um, and it's a lot prettier than it used to be. So for one of the, the biggest feature to me is that we actually get a uh, syntax for defining modules finally, um, kind of Pythonic in a way. And so in this case, I'm defining a default exports um, for my, my uh, person function here. Um, and we can consume modules, also looking a little bit Pythonic, where I can say, all right, give me the, the high function from this hello module, and there you go. Um, pretty neat. This is beautiful. Uh, if you've ever worked with object literals, um, now you don't have to append um, a function inside of there. You can just give it a name, and you're off to the races. So much cleaner. Uh, this removes a ton of code. Looks way better. Uh, we have classes. Just as Java gets lambdas, JavaScript gets classes. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, this works the way you would think it would work. Um, You've got a constructor function. You've got inheritance. Uh, you can add static members. Uh, pretty clean, finally. JavaScript. Sorry? Can you? No, you cannot do. Well, it's JavaScript. You, you, can, you can create a multiple inheritance nightmare if you want to. There's, there's ways. You can, there's a thing called object assign, which would allow you to uh, add as many mix-ins as you want to get that kind of uh, behavior. Uh, this is another personal favorite of mine, the fat arrow function. Um, if you come from CoffeeScript land, you, you've probably seen the single arrow. Uh, so this is now finally uh, in JavaScript itself. This lets us do a shorthand for a function call. Uh, so much cleaner than writing out an entire function. Um, in this case, I'm, I'm passing an, uh, you know, each fruit one at a time, and I'm calling uppercase. Not really all that big of a deal. Remember earlier how I was hating on uh, the template tag? This is kind of why. Um, in ES6, we get a concept called template strings, which allow us to have multi-line strings and do string interpolation, um, like right here. This is so nice. Uh, if, you, if you have templates, I don't know why you wouldn't use this, personally. Uh, it makes a lot more sense to me to embed this type of thing in your program. Um, there's a ton of other niceties, uh, just a lot of sugar, really. Um, there's nothing super new in the functionality of JavaScript. You just have to write a lot less of it, which um, usually results in better programs. 
We can't do this natively today. Uh, you can do some of this stuff natively today in IOJS, the node fork. Um, but for the most part, if we're going to go back into browser land, we have to transpile or compile it. Uh, but the good news is there's great tools for this. Babel.js is probably the most popular one right now, but Tracer from Google also works well. Um, I like to do Babel with Browserify in a thing called Babelify, um, which, you know, I like how we've run out of names for things, so now just programmer talk is like total nonsense. Uh, I Babelified my code, and that actually meant something. Um, <laughs> so I personally like to publish modules in NPM. Um, everybody has their own sort of thing. That's, that's fine. Um, I've found NPM to be a little bit better. I don't want multiple package systems in my production code base, but you know, your mileage may vary. One of the things that we do very explicitly when we publish a module is that we compile it back to ES5. We don't publish modules as ES6 source or CoffeeScript or TypeScript or anything. If someone's consuming your module, they don't, you don't want to also put the burden on them to figure out how to compile this thing back to ES5. Their, their build chain would turn into a nightmare. Um, so, if we pull all these concepts together, we can get a pretty good look at how code might be written in a few years here um, for the web. Um, so you author your source code in ES6, you compile it down into ES5 and you distribute it that way. Um, we can use package JSON to point to the dist folder. We can deploy this thing to GitHub pages and we can even use source maps to have step debugging if we want to, to walk through these components. Um, I created a very trivial, silly uh, date element. I actually stole the idea from uh, GitHub, who uses custom elements themselves uh, for the date time uh, helper in, in uh, their UI. Um, and for fun, I did it using ES6 syntax. And so here we are just extending the built-in span element. And when I'm creating, well, as soon as this thing is created, we're going to just insert this uh, text node inside of it. Um, where we're going to grab the date. Um, th I have the source code for this running, and I'll, I'll give you the links for it so you can check it out. So th there's obviously problems remain. This isn't like going to be the ultimate solution, but componentizing is, is definitely a trend that we're seeing in, in all the various um, JavaScript frameworks. And so it, it feels like this is the right direction. The collective has kind of agreed that, hey, maybe encapsulating my code might be a good idea. Um, Web Components JS uh, is kind of big, and it's a little bit strange. Um, it has to go backwards in time and support browsers that are a little more hostile, so the source code for it's a little weird. It is worth checking out. Um, none of this solves CSS, so, you know, you, you get to keep that problem, um, <laughs> which is kind of unfortunate, and I think Shadow DOM's going to help us a lot there, but um, we're just not there yet. Um, if you're doing a lot of these register elements, it's conceivable that your app could get quite slow because you're blocking when you're doing this as a synchronous call. Um, there's no other way to really do it. No one's figured out a way to do it yet anyhow. If you're rendering the page and you've got these, these um, custom elements in it, it they're, they're effectively going to be treated just like a span unless we can stop execution, register this thing with the parser, and then do the right thing when, when we hit it. Um, Something else worth noting, and React really forces you from uh, writing code that could mutate state and have side effects, um, which I really like, and I think we could learn a lot from. Um, in web components land, you know, you've got all the rope to hang yourself. So if you mutate state, um, you know, it's, it's your problem to solve. Henrik uh, Joburg, Joburg? God, I can't remember his last name right now. I think it's Joburg. Jotag? Anyways, the guy behind ampersand JS uh, says that the future is probably not going to be the same as today. And so your best bet is to optimize for the future, and I really like that. I think that's a nice way of looking at things. Andy Hunt uh, from the Pragmatic Programmers recently said, you know, we should be thinking more about disposable units of code instead of reusable units of code. And that's more likely that if as your code base goes on, you're going to be rewriting parts. And encapsulating these bits so that we can pull chunks out and change them just makes a whole lot of good sense. Um, CSS is still a mess. Uh, there's really nothing to, to be said about it. It's, it's not a good idea. We're combining so many different concepts at the same time, from layout to aesthetic to reset. Um, at some point, this is going to have to be fixed. Um, and encapsulating these bits would really, really help a lot. And it doesn't make sense that if I have a tab bar implementation that it could override, I don't know, my, my side menu implementation. Um, I think React has really proven that immutable state is a good thing, um, and the VDOM and the batching concepts there should probably be brought into your development methodology, whatever it might be. 
Um, and I think it, we could see it happening in, uh, in web components land at some point. If you want to check out the source code for this stuff, um, and actually I'll jump over there right now so you can. Oh God, what did I do? So here, here's my web component. And if I inspect this element, you can see date today, which is pretty cool. And if I take a look, oh no, is it only minified? No, it's not. Oh, Firefox, you failed me. I was just about to say, Firefox developer edition's awesome. <laughs> and it is. You can check out the source code anyhow um, on my GitHub at github.com slash Brian LaRue slash date today. Eventually, when it loads. Come on, really. There we go. And so if we see the source code, it's like literally, almost literally what I had um, in that slide where I'm defining a class, and I'm registering the element, and I'm exporting it. And I'm using uh, Babelify to uh, compile this down to ES5 code. It's pretty clean. Uh, I think this is a nice way to work. And I think that we're starting to track onto like building um, better apps by doing this sort of thing. And uh, that's it. That's all I got for you guys. Uh, but I think I have some questions, maybe.